And welcome one and all. Thank you for joining us. And a special thanks for those of you that view this later on as it gets posted on the web. You're welcome to join us when you can. Um, today's topic is talking about, you've turned this nice piece of wood, now how do you really identify what the heck is it? And what do people use and how do you go about trying to narrow down the, the choices? So the, uh, let me see. I want to be able to share, here we go. There is some uh, interesting things that uh, I have learned to glom on to. And if I share that, can you all see this? Hello. Can see you see what? a patchwork door? Uh, I see some uh, small images, screenshots. Aha. See here. Okay. And it's got that, but not this. Yeah, we're seeing your folder. Yep. How about that? Okay, there. This is one way to help identify what kind of wood you've got. And it comes from an unusual source. If you go to the state park in Flagstaff, um, where there's the house where the two brothers had and ran the lumber business up there, they have this door that's made up of all kinds of pieces of samples of wood. And that shows what the door looks like. And then if you go to the key, all right, now why did you do that? That's the Riordan house in, Pre in Flagstaff. Correct. Thank you. Being very difficult this morning, computer. Well, now I want to show this. But anyhow, there's a picture of a uh, next to it that shows what all those various woods are. For some reason, you're not letting me do that. There we go. There. So then you can look at this, and that tells you what each of those woods are that are in that door. Hmm. So that's a crude way and limited way, um, but that's one way you can get some idea. And I like this approach because it's not all shiny and new. And uh, you can go through and see if you can identify anything. So what else do people do? to try to identify the woods. I take it to breakfast and ask you guys. <laughs> that is my best way too. <laughs> For those well, there, are, there are some websites that I have found uh, 
I was looking for them quickly this morning and of course couldn't find them. But um, some of them are of limited, you know, they're fairly small samples they have on, on the website. Um, but at least it, it, it's something. Well, while you're talking about that, yes. Now I've got this. Why when I get to here, I can't. Aha. There we go. No, we've got a picture of Ken now. Yeah, Ken's back online, but uh, my camera is not working in my laptop, so I'm going to have to troubleshoot that offline, and that's too bad. I had a couple of things I wanted to show, but I'll just have to verbally describe some resources that I've come across. Here's one of the things Gary was just talking about in terms of websites. This is one, wordworking.org. And it's wood sampler, and they break down the types of woods, and then you can click on those images, and it'll take you in and show you what that particular wood looks like. So this takes some uh, hunting and pecking to get used to, <clears throat> but it is probably, for me, the most complete thing I've found. Yeah, the problem I have with those websites is the wood can be so variable. Um, it can be close, but it's not the same. Well, is it close to that or is it close to something else? I agree. And like Dan said, to me, the best thing is to just take it to the Tuesday breakfast. <laughs> and for those of you that are watching on the web, we meet at the back burner in Prescott Valley Tuesday mornings at seven o'clock for breakfast. So some people have suggested we ought to call that the Romeo group, retired old men eating out. <laughs> but uh, you're welcome to join us at that venue if you can't make the club meetings, which are the third Saturday of the month at YEI at the airport in Prescott. The fourth Saturday of every month, except May and November. That's right. And December, right? Well, there is no meeting in December because that's the holiday dinner. Right. Great. Sorry if I repeat something you guys did while I was offline, but I do have a few resources that I can share with you. It's too bad my camera's not working because I wanted to show these to you, but I'll just have to describe them. Um, can you see this? Yes, I can see that. And that's Good identification. That's another website. And you can click on hardwoods or softwoods, and then as you scroll down, it gives you lists and shows you pictures. Also the woods, that's a possibility to use. There's also printed reference books to that effect too. I have uh, several of them that, uh, actually there's, there's one that has a picture of the wood, picture of the tree, leaves, uh, gives uh, identif various identifying names, the botanical names and the common names. And it's surprising how many different common names there are for the same tree. Um, so it's, it's a handy reference. That one is called the Wood Identification and Use by Terry Porter. And it looks like it's very similar to what you just pulled up on the screen, Bruce. There's another one that is called um, Goodwood Handbook by Albert Jackson and David Jay. 
And that also has, it's a smaller set, uh, but has some very good pictures of lumber pieces of these woods. So you can see the grain, the color, it gives uh, various names for it. Um, there, if you want to go really scientific, I've got a book called Identifying Wood Accurate Results with Simple Tools by Bruce Hoadley, in which he will show you how to uh, slice off a thin slice of wood and using a magnifying glass, look carefully at the grain structure and orientation and come up with exactly what wood you're dealing with. That's a little bit above my interest level, but it's available. Another thing that you may have just referenced is, um, and you can get this on Amazon, is you can buy sets of veneer of woods. And I've got a set of woods that each veneer, they're about uh, four inches by eight inches. <clears throat> it shows you exactly what the grain is like. It has a label on each piece. For example, this first one is Aphromosia from West Africa. It has other things like bloodwood, um, smoke eucalyptus, mahogany. It's got a lot of common woods. And so I've got that as reference. And like so many of my references, they're just that. They're reference. I <laughs> unfortunately don't go back and refer to them very often, but I have them if I really need it. Um, one other thing you may recall from our, I got the date, yeah, June 20, June 9th, 2021, on our chips and grits on that day, uh, I had come across a listing of trees native to Arizona and shared that with everybody on chips and grits. And I believe I sent a copy of that link um, by email after that. And it breaks it down by trees native to Arizona, below 4,500 feet, between 4,500 and 6,000 feet, and above 6,000 feet. So if you're picking up local woods, this might help you narrow it down to uh, what, what wood was that that you found on the ground? What wood was that? Uh, what wood was that? <laughs> Say that fast. I'll let you do that, Dan. Does anybody use the wood database? Yes, I have accessed that a few times. But again, it's like my other reference materials. I know it's there. I don't use it frequently. What, what amazes me is, uh, for example, like mahogany, there's like 10 different mahoganies. I, I had one that I, I found that one article said that there's only two real mahoganies. One of them is Cuban mahogany. Uh, I don't know which is which. I don't know who to believe. Uh, and then when you get down to maples, there's like 20 different maples. Um, it again can be awfully, um, shall we say, detailed uh, and blow your mind away. So. I think the idea of Tuesday morning breakfast, whatever was decided there, is a good way to go. Hey, Ken. Yes. Are your are your reference books available through the PAW library? I don't know. Um, I think at least one of these is. I'm not sure the other two, and Kathy is not here right now, so I can't check with her. Um, I know Kathy sent to you, Jay, the uh, list of library books. I believe it's on the line online now. And I could look at that, but haven't checked it to see if these particular books are there. So if you had to pick one that's been the most useful, which one would it be, Ken? Uh, probably the Wood Identification and Use by Terry Porter. I'm looking at that now with your example of mahogany. I want to look up, just looking in the index, under mahogany, you got African mahogany, American, Australian red, big leaf, Brazilian, 
East Indian, I can't even pronounce that one, Hawaiian, Miva, New England, Red, Sapele, Scented, and Swan River, and Mahogany Eucalyptus Red. So there's Mahogany. I don't even know how many of those I read, but each one of those has a separate entry in this particular book. It's interesting that Sapele comes under Mahogany, because it does, I must say, it reminds me of it. Huh, okay. Yes, and let me look up that particular reference page. Um, the wood database does not list Sapele. It has swamp mahogany, Santos, Philippine, Mountain, Honduran, Cuban, and African. So, I question who determines what they really are. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where you may have to get back into the more scientific descriptions to narrow that down. And I'm just not interested in spending the time to do that. Under the category from Sapelli in this one book, it says also called scented mahogany, Sapelli mahogany, abudicro, pinkra, Sapelli wood, and Sapelli. And it doesn't it doesn't give a lot more information to differentiate the different kinds of mahogany here. I'd have to look up some of the other categories, but it, it's confusing at best. So what I end up doing is taking it to Tuesday breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Sapele under the wood database, Dean, and yeah, it says most mahogany-like woods are scentless and can So it's comparing it to mahogany. Yeah. Yeah, you take it to the Tuesday breakfast and you'll get four or five different opinions of what it is. Yeah. Just like the web. Yeah. And of course, every one of those opinions is correct. Yeah. I don't know what kind of mahogany we typically get. It's uh, the American mahogany describes it as coming from Central America, Brazilian, Honduras, Cuba. Then it goes on to describe the uh, various properties and uses, etc. Maple. Like you said, Dean, maple has a whole bunch of different types of maple, too. For example, I'm aware that box elder is a type of maple. <clears throat> it just happens to have been attacked by bugs, and it has a defense mechanism that gives it the red uh, coloring. I'll just say maple. Oh, geez, there's about 30 different descriptions of maple in this particular book. So there are references out there. It's up to you to use them or not. Dean, you and Jay are talking about the wood database. Is yeah. there, how do you find that? I'm sorry, how do I define it? How do you find it? Oh. I just typed in the wood database. Okay. And he's, I've looked at that for several years, but it's still, you know, in the same tree, you can find different colors and grains and so forth. And so how, uh, it's, it's just extremely difficult. Like Ken was saying, unless you get a magnifying glass out and put it under a microscope and, put on a white jacket and safety glasses and uh, wash your hands. Good. Yeah. Um, hey, Bruce, it is wood dash database.com. Thank you, sir. And it's for me, it's one of the best databases that gives Janka hardness. So, you know, um, especially when you're mixing woods with resins and resins are like rock and, you want to make sure that you're putting a wood next to it that has some kind of hardness with it. 
That's a good point, uh, Jay. And just again, looking at the book I've been referring you to, it doesn't give that Janka hardness. It does have specific gravity, which I guess you could use to infer uh, how hard the material is. Also has dry weights, but it doesn't have that hardness value. Yeah. Yeah, it says here Sapelli is 1,360 pounds hardness and 6,060 newtons. So now that you know that, I can measure it. Yeah. Well, without rereading it, what I recall is it's a 44 caliber ball, and it's the amount of force needed to embed the 44 caliber round ball 50% into the wood. Okay, so it's just like doing a hardness test on metal. Metal, yeah. Yeah, it's the equivalent of, a, say, a Rockwell C hardness test, but adjusted for wood. Right. It's interesting, again, looking in this particular book under maple, uh, there's two opposing pages of big leaf maple, and the opposite page is box elder. They have handwritten diagrams of the tree shapes and the leaves and the seeds. Even though they're both in the maple family, they're entirely different. The leaves are, for the big leaf maple, look like what I typically think of as maple. I, I think we think of silver maple usually. The box elder leaves don't look like maple at all to me. The big leaf maple seeds are just small seed pods, whereas a box elder has the uh, whirly gig type of seeds that you see spinning coming off the tree. So hmm. just calling it maple is a pretty broad category. And then there's a Jap Japanese maple on the next page. Again, entirely different. So get back to the question you started this with. How can you pick up a piece of wood and know what you've got? Well, I'm talking about maple, when I'm looking at it, it says maple, black maple. It doesn't look black to me. <laughs> and then right below it is striped maple. Or, I don't know. I wonder how many of these terms come up strictly because of the geographic area of the world they grow in. Somebody you know, comes up with. Well, yeah. and the, the book I've been referring you from does show where these grow, but this other book I have actually has it broken down into uh, your hardwoods and softwoods and then by region. Well, the list uh, you mentioned that of uh, trees in Arizona yeah. might be a good place to start, and that should take care of most of what we get here, right? Yes, and in fact, I got that list directly off of the internet, uh, the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management website. And I, I, <laughs> there's, a, there's a page wide list of the actual URL. I'm not gonna try to repeat it. But if you go out to the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management, um, I drilled down through some links and came up with this list of um, trees native to Arizona by elevation. So mm. you can see that you know, below the 4,500 feet, so go down to Phoenix, and here's a list of the trees that are native down there. Of course, that's hard to tell now because they brought in so many landscaping trees. Uh, go up to um, Flagstaff, and you might look at the trees above 6,000 feet. And so the, to find that reference link, again, go out to the Arizona uh, Department of Forestry and Fire Management. Or refer to June 9th, 2021, Chips and Grits notes, if you still have those. That sounds Around. like, I'm gonna say sure. that sounds like it might be the most useful you know, for us, 
Yes, because we fit into this middle category between 4,500 and 6,000 feet. And um, box elder maple is one of the native trees in this area. Uh, Arizona cypress, uh, Arizona ash, Arizona walnut, alligator juniper, uh, pinion pine, Arizona sycamore, cottonwood, choke cherry, gimbal oak, shrub live oak. So it can kind of narrow down your choices if you're going out and finding it growing naturally in our area. Yeah, so that would probably take care of most of what we do unless you, you know, get into one of these wood sales where we've organized from time to time. Where yeah. stuff comes in from like Oregon. For example, the uh, what uh, well, Mark sent around uh, the picture. I think, Bruce, you took the picture of that pile of wood that was somewhere near a bank recently. Yes. And you thought it was a cottonwood. Well, if it is cottonwood, then that would probably be Fremont cottonwood, according to this list. Hmm. And if you can start with that and then go to the wood database, it might give you more info that that may or may not be helpful to you. So the one from the Arizona forestry is just a, a word list? Yes, it's just a text list. Okay, so then you would need to couple that with something that gave you pictures to see what yes. you had. Yes. Uh, it's been a couple of years now since I found that list of trees, so I don't remember what was what else was on that website it may or may not have had some descriptors but i don't think so however for each of these trees on their list it has a link an external link uh some hyperlink to the what looks like the uh the botanical name for that particular tree I haven't followed those links, so I don't know just what other information is there, but there might be a wealth of information available there. Very interesting. Thanks for mentioning that. You're welcome. What else does anybody use? Ah, Jay's put the link in the chats. Yeah, you scroll about halfway down and I think you'll you'll see what Ken was talking about. We've got native trees below 4,500 feet, 4,500 to 6,000, above 6,000. And then a whole bunch of Latin stuff. Yeah, and that's exact. I just cut and pasted those lists into a, a Word document, and I'm pretty sure I sent that by email to, um, I don't know if it was the whole group, I mean, or the whole membership, or just those who are on Chips and Grits that particular week. Uh, maybe I, could, uh, Bruce, I'll see if I can find that. If I did send it as an email, I'll send you a copy. And maybe you can decide if you want to have Marge distribute that to members too. Okay, that would be good. Thank you. I and honestly Jay, don't yes, know. Yes, you found exactly the right link there. That's that long list. Yeah, but you know, I honestly don't think I'd be able to identify any of these. Choke cherry. Got Gooding's willow. Flowering yeah. crab apple and quaking aspen. Well, you should be able to recognize quaking aspen. Yeah, it shakes like crazy when you stand next to it. <laughs> well, since there's silence. Out of the tens of thousands of species of wood out there, what was the best wood to turn?
for a beginner. The wood you have on your lathe? Yeah, I was going to say, for, what, for, what's available? For a beginner. Oh, maple. Yes. yes. Yeah. A good second would be cherry. Box elder turns very nicely, I think. Yeah. Yes, I agree. So you oh. don't like oak? No, I do not like oak. I don't like oak either, Dean. I agree. The other one, if you can get a hold of it, olive wood. Uh, oh, yeah. It turns yes. nice and it looks gorgeous when it's done. Yeah. Yes. Dean, I have to qualify too that I've found there is a difference between uh, hard maple and soft maple. They they turn similarly, but the sanding seems to be different for the two. Um, I have more trouble with a, getting a nice finish on soft maple than I do on hard maple. The hard maple is just that. It's much harder and causes a little bit more of a problem when turning. I'd agree with that. I thought it was interesting looking at the wood database one. One of the comments at the very beginning was, uh, is it, is it really wood? <laughs> They, they, you know, because of our furniture that we have and so many uh, manufactured and products that are out there that, you know, they're made for a gazillion different reasons. And whether they really would or not, and can you turn it, you know? I'm sure all of us love to turn MDF, you know? <laughs> Well, actually, that's a good question, though, because bamboo is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, Kathy bought some a cheap uh, uh, bookcase recently through Amazon. It's yeah. all bamboo. Yeah. I don't know how bamboo turns. I wonder if you can get pieces thick enough to turn uh, reasonably. Uh, it would probably have to be laminated. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing with some of the furniture now, they're painting the finish on. Paint? So, yeah, it, it's it's almost like a decal um, to make it look like it's a nice kind of wood. But it's just over a like MDF type board. Uh, and so it's not, it's not good to do anything else with. In my opinion, I'm not sure where I got it, but I picked up, and maybe some of you are have it too. But a a box of sampled hardwoods from Woodworker Source, and they're like two inches by four inch or two by three pieces, half inch thick, and quite a variety of different woods in there, and that, that they sell. And I've, I've referred to that with, with different customers a couple of times when they have no idea what wood is and, and so forth. Well, that sounds like it's a similar kit to this uh, set of veneer wood yeah. pieces that I yeah. picked up as a set. Yeah. How many pieces are in the set? Uh, I think it depends on which set you buy from which manufacturer. This one I think there's something like 36 to 40 different oh, wow. veneers in this set. That's similar to what's in the box I have. Let's see, this came from Sours and Company Veneers and it has a website, www.sveneers.com. So, www.sveneers.com 
but I'm pretty sure I bought this directly off of Amazon as a as a set. And they had multiple sets of different sizes and different quantities. I'm looking at Woodworker Source and their kit is 30 pieces, but they're asking $90 for the box. I didn't pay anywhere near that for this. I didn't pay anything for mine. I left out, I guess. But it's got mostly uh, woods that we will use in turning or woodworking in, around our area. Okay, for what it's worth in this more scientific book, it says that hardness of wood is closely related to specific gravity. The higher its specific gravity, the harder the wood. And then it has a couple of tables of various woods and the specific gravities, but I can't find any reference to the Jenka hardness test. So they're just relying on specific gravity. And that may be why that's the only parameter shown in this other reference book. Can you approximate specific gravity if you weigh it and then accurately measure it and figure out what the weight per volume is? I would have guessed you can do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you should be able to ratio that. Well, and this scientific book even has diagrams on flotation method for specific gravity, and it shows a stick floating in a beaker of water. Mm -hmm. What the other end of this stick is attached to is, I don't know. It has a whole chart in here for chart for determining the specific gravity and error density. But it seems to me that the... Uh, the Jenka hardness scale would be more important for things like a um, manufacturer who makes wooden flooring. You want the flooring to look good, but you also don't want it to ding easily. So that hardness, I think, would be a, a critical parameter regardless of the specific gravity. And I think for most of what we're doing, I don't know that that matters. I mean, other than like Jay was saying, if you're casting something, you don't want to cast, you know, a soft pine in hard acrylic. Or vice wooden, versa. Yeah, wooden sand worth a darn. Yeah, it makes it real difficult. And I, I have a highly scientific method. I use my thumbnail. <laughs> try to try to gouge how deep I can gouge gouge a little piece of wood with my thumbnail, and that'll tell me if I want to cast it or not. Mm -hmm. Is you that want? your right thumbnail or left thumbnail? Because you know, uh, it might be you need to calibrate. Broke the right when I'm on left now. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Jay, that's probably just as valid as some of the other tests we uh, might refer to. It certainly is on the spot. Yeah, it works. Pretty good accuracy. Well, I would imagine that the difference in the hardness would apply even if you're not doing resin, but if you're trying to laminate uh, some different woods, like for... Um, yeah, segmented. segmented. Yeah. 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 No. yeah. And it's something that I, I don't hear a lot of guys in the club that pay a lot of attention to wood hardness. But um I know it's relevant with some of the some of the things that I do. Well, I do recall that when Heidi was doing her uh workshop recently for the um Christmas ornament, segmented Christmas ornament she pointed out that you do want to have fairly similar hardnesses for your segments for that very reason. She made a point of uh, telling everybody that. 
Yeah. And for that, the wood database is the only place I've found with a real um, consistent Janko rating. And there's a couple other places. One is Bell Forest. Yes. Um, Bell Forest has a chart that shows uh, Janko ratings also. Is it the hardness or the grain or the oils in the wood? Hardness. Or all three. Yeah. I, I'm wondering if, if you have like a a teak, does teak work well with resin? Where do you get teak anymore? Gary. <laughs> you forgot yeah. that, didn't you, Gary? Yeah. Somebody gave me some, uh, and I decided I had too much junk in me. So I gave it to Dean. We swapped some wood. But, of course, you bring up another a good point there, Dean, oily woods you know let alone you know, just coca boa you know you got to be careful sometimes when you're trying to put that with something else as oily as, as it is yeah. well this is fun I also remember when I took the class, we had somebody that uh, made a stool and they decided they wanted to do the top out of Paduke. And um, <laughs> oh. we, we all had to, you know, brush our clothes off of the red dust as we left the shop. There is one thing about all of these exotic woods that you need to keep in mind is uh, our instructor when I took the class gave some of that wood to her neighbor to burn in the fireplace and they ended up in the hospital because a lot of it was toxic so you just need to keep in mind when you have the exotic woods that are toxic what you do with them or if you give them away people ought to know that Yeah, and on that note, you may recall we did have a chips and grits on tox wood toxicity uh, way back in April 27th of 2021. And there was a link to, let's see if I can find that, a uh, link to the list. And I know AAW has a list, a link to uh, this. And I think the, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the, um, the databases you've been referring to, both of them, have links to wood toxicity. Is that? Yeah, the, the wood database has a section called allergies and toxicity. Yeah, in fact, that's the link that I referred to in the uh, chips and grits is the wood yeah. database um link here i think if you just assume it's all toxic you'll be and take the appropriate protection you'll probably be better off yeah has has anybody else had um i got a splinter of purple heart in my hand not too long ago and it seemed to take forever to heal. Yeah. But I don't know if that's common or purple heart or not. I think well, I would pur purple heart, but I sure had it with wingy or wingy, however you pronounce it. I get a sliver of that in me, and man, does it fester. Are you guys taking the sliver out? Yes. yes. <laughs> as soon as you can. Yes. Sometimes they're too small to take out. And I think that taking a long time to heal is called old age. <laughs> Speak for yourself, Jerry. <laughs> I one time had a, uh, 
It's one of the reasons why I turn with a glove now on my left hand. Coca Boa, my hand just I turned out something and right in in here, you know, where the chips would hit, that whole part of my hand just swelled. And of course, it was about three days before my open heart surgery. <laughs> what was the wood that Ed Jones had trouble with? Coca Boa. Okay. I've uh, I've had problem with Coca Boa. Tried to rip some of it on the table saw, and it was warm in the shop and on my arms, because uh, my arms are like yours, very tender. Uh, I rashed out on that for about a day, little spots all over and so forth. Another one I ran into a couple of weeks ago, over in front of Mag, they had a locust tree and uh, cut it down. And I got one of the spikes in my forearm. And within about four minutes, that forearm was the size of a silver dollar and raising up and hurting like that. Mm -hmm. Something in there that didn't like me. Uh, I think also that our manufactured woods concern me as much or more if you get into that than some of our natural woods. We don't know what chemicals are in that stuff that make it. Well, I know when we were Jerry and Spence and a bunch of us were in the class together, our instructor, it was an assignment you know, she gave us these toxicity. She said, go check these woods for toxicity, et cetera. And one of them she had on the list was juniper. And she didn't allow it in class. And I came back the next week and said, juniper is not on any lists I could find. And she said, yeah, but a lot of people in the Prescott area are allergic to it. So the dust, et cetera, could be a, a problem, even though juniper smells good, et cetera, et cetera. Some people are, you know, look how bad our allergies get when the juniper start, uh, the juniper pollen starts. Yeah. Dean, you touched on something. I just want to caution everybody, too. If you had a rash on your arm from <clears throat> the, the sawdust in contact with your skin, if anybody ever has starts to have difficulty with tongue swelling, lips go numb, difficulty breathing, call 911 right away and get some help because that's the beginning sign of anaphylactic shock. This has driven home to for us recently because we have a granddaughter who was hospitalized last week because she ate at a Chinese restaurant back in New York, and she has a severe peanut allergy. She's been mm. carrying an EpiPen with her since she was uh, probably a toddler. And this is the first time she ever had to use that EpiPen. She was hospitalized. Even in the hospital, they had to give her two more Epi shots. I'm sorry, three more Epi shots that evening. She's ended up she was ended up in the uh, ICU. They had a epinephrine drip going with, on for a couple of days. It can become very, very serious and much faster than you think. So if you feel any constriction of your throat, any swelling in your mouth or throat or area or difficulty breathing, don't ignore it. Get some medical help right away. It can be fatal. Hmm. Thanks for the tip. Sorry, I have to have a tip like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, back to the original subject of the types of woods, it almost, one of the thoughts that came across my mind was maybe we spend too much time trying to figure out what the wood is. Does it really make a difference? If it's pretty, it's pretty. I I think sometimes we can get, as woodworkers in general, hung up on, oh, it's an exotic, fancy wood, and we forget the basics of 
what are we making with this and what does it look like when we're done? Because mm -hmm. it's an eighty-dollar piece of wood, um, doesn't necessarily mean that what you're going to end up with is, you know, a five hundred-dollar piece. <laughs> and yet, I've seen some stuff that you pick up, uh, you know, like uh, Madeline did the other day, brought in that chunk of maple. And the first time I looked at it, I was, "Wow, oh, why are you turning that again?" And Rick, you might know what I'm talking about. Uh, with her turning and it, it's going to be beautiful and it's free. And, and you're like, so, you know, Gary, I think you're right. It's, you can take segmenting or hollowing or whatever. And if you don't have a good farm or shape, uh, maybe only your wife or girlfriend is going to like it. Or both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's really the pits when they both fight over it. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's why they make paint too, right? Yeah. And dyes. Well, <clears throat> I I don't focus a whole lot on what the wood is, particularly if it's come out of my wood pile or somebody else's. Um and even though we can describe things as fogwood found on ground, more often than not, mine wasn't found on the ground. It was found somewhere. But what I end up calling it, though, is unknown pretty wood. If it, the grain pops out, I don't really care what the wood is. If it's a very pretty uh, grain pattern and a pretty color, it doesn't matter where the wood came from or what it is. It's just a very pretty wood. Well, I remember when Wayne Wolf at one of the sales, somebody asked him, well, what kind of wood is it? He says, oh, that's Arctic banana wood. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, that wasn't Wayne Wolf. That was, uh, that was um, Barry and uh, um, Wayne. Uh, Hunt. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what I meant. Wayne Hunt. Yeah. Yeah. I like to use, be able to say where the piece of wood came from, if there's any history in behind it. You know, mm -hmm. Sometimes that makes a lot of difference if you're, you know, you just turn the piece and told people a couple of you might have been over at, uh, some viewed a few years ago, a couple gave us a whole maple tree. And Dan, I think you might have been there if you're still here. Um, but I shared with them that, you know, that came from Thumb Butte. For some reason, it just adds a little bit of uh, intrigue into the piece of return. <laughs> or it came from Home Depot. Or I think a lot of times, especially when I'm talking about the mesquite at a sale, you know, I always said, yeah, this came up from the valley. You know, yeah. and then I'll tell them a story about, you know, somebody will have family members down there and a tree goes down and a call goes out. Hey, there's a mesquite yeah. tree down. Come out and get wood. Gentlemen, I got to leave you. I got to go get poked by a doctor. So. All right. Thanks for joining us. Um, thank you for putting it on. Glad to see you online, Dean. Well, I'll try to be here more often if you'll let me on. We'll vote on that after you leave. Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right. Bye, Dean. <laughs> Take care. Related to Dean's comment and, the, and Jerry's, uh, Gary's comment, I grew up or spent a lot of years, we lived in on Mars Street in Idaho Falls. And when the kids were growing up, we planted a maple tree in our front yard. And over a period of time, I had to cut some branches off and eventually had to cut the tree down. Um, this was before I ever did any wood turning, but I decided to preserve some of that wood and I still have some of it here with me. And every time I turn it, it has a unique 
coloring and grain to it. And so what I started doing was because that has some significant um, significance to me personally, I started calling it Mars Maple. And mm. I actually sign it as Mars Maple on the bottom. And then I can associate a story with it if people are interested. That, yeah, my kids grew up under this tree. It, it has significance to me. That might be how all those trees and the, all the wood in the wood database got their names. Mm. Well, they didn't all grow in my front yard. <laughs> yeah, they're not all named Mars. But, but, but you're right, Jay. You, you don't know where some of these names came from or why. Um, and looking at that list, native. What, why do they have, call it cat claw acacia? Well, that one may be physically thorns. It, so it is. That's what I. Yeah, that's what I've heard about that. Is because the thorns are like this instead of like the other acacias. Yeah. So where do some of these other names come from? Yeah, that's a good good point, Jay. Mm -hmm. I think they came from the U.S. Department of Ag Agriculture and the U.S. Geological Service that received a grant and they had to come up with something to show their worthiness, so they named wood. <laughs> <laughs> or like just the difference between the same piece of wood from, if you get the uh, British Wood Turning Magazine, you know, yeah. they call, yeah. call things different in that part of the world than we do, and the same with Australia. You know, I, I agree with the story behind where the wood came from. You guys might recall somebody came by one of our monthly meetings quite a while ago and dumped off a whole bunch of pews, white oak mm. pews yeah. from <laughs> from St. George's Catholic Church in Apache Junction. And I took a whole bunch of those and I've made uh, numerous cutting boards and various things with them. And that story of where the wood came from is really intriguing to a lot of people. Jay, do you relate that story just verbally to them or have you written up a short blurb and given it to, uh, with the cutting boards or the item? If it's a cutting board and it's big enough, I'll engrave it on the bottom of the cutting board. Hmm. With a CNC machine and then fill, in, fill it in with colored paint and then just coat over it. I think people appreciate things like that. If there's a story, it has more significance. Yeah. yeah. So everybody's going to have to start thinking creatively now and come up with a story for every piece you turn. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's a True story or not, doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. It probably wouldn't be hard with all the problems some of the pieces give us when we're turning them. You know, it's easy to come up with stories. Yeah, but you can't call everything that damn piece. Yeah. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Uh, I was given given a whole bunch of wine barrel staves, and I've been scratching them, and I can't get wine out of it. So I'm not <laughs> sure what to do with those. You're supposed to soak them. Yeah, I think they've already been soaked. No, <laughs> <laughs> so you can make oak cutting boards out of them and put that on the bottom. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the direction it's heading. Yeah. What else does anybody have this morning? We've gotten some good sites to go look at, some reference, some good books to check out. So, Bruce, regarding... I'll, I'll try to send this email to you once I find it. And if interested, I'll put the uh, titles and authors of these books I've referred to in that same email, then you can share it with people. Excellent. Thank you. Sir. And I'll, Kathy won't be back until Friday afternoon. So I, uh, I guess I could look online to see if her, her list is up to date, by the way, Jay, and Jay recently put it on the website. Correct me if that's wrong, Jay. That's what she told me. 
Yeah, and I was just going to say that if if you haven't seen it, take a look at our website and under more information, the first link is PAW library materials. Uh, there's two links that Kathy created below that. There's one for books and one for DVDs, and you can select which one you want, and it'll take you to an online database that is searchable. And that's everything that we have in our library uh, inventory. Mm. So all you have to do is request it, send an email to Kathy. She'll bring it to the next monthly meeting and hand it over to you. Excellent. Somebody's getting too organized for us. <laughs> I was explaining to Kathy that uh, I found some technology that is that indexes the database. Oh, this is getting too geeky, guys. I know, but you know, it it indexes the database and uh, filters the search as you type. So it's it's pretty interesting technology. As you type, as you type, yeah. So that's like words autocorrect function then. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Wow. Pretty much, but I was thinking that if it ever expands and becomes cumbersome, we're gonna need something like that. So might as well embed the capability from the beginning versus yeah. trying to update it later. Wow, and where, what is this? So, uh, is it a... Commercial software? Is it a freeware? Is it an app? Where did you find this thing? It's actually standard database indexing techniques, but for HTML, there's some software available that it's limited, but it's free, and it does what we need it to do for now. If we ever expand and go a little further with it, we'll probably have to buy it for $39. But uh, as it is now, it's free, and it works great. Hmm. Well, that's good to know. I'm glad you're aware of that. And you said you implemented that on this list? Yeah. Yeah. If you If you just click on either the books or the DVDs list and... If you look at the search bar, whatever you type into the search, the results below will automatically filter as you're typing. Okay, well, it's just like Google then. When you're up on the Google line, you start typing, it starts. Right, right, exactly, yeah. exactly. Oh, okay. In the database world, it's referred to as indexing, and it's it's technology that's been available forever. But getting it to this level and implementing it in something that isn't just ridiculously cumbersome is uh, is the trick. So we got it. Good step for you, by Jay. step, step yeah. by step. Okay, okay, I, I've got to get going too. So um... yeah, was well, does anybody else have anything? If not, we're just wrapping. See most of the wrap. Yeah, see you next, most of you next Tuesday. Hopefully okay. I'll have my camera fixed by the next one, but uh, thanks again <laughs> for doing this, Bruce. Yeah. Not a we problem. know what Ken's doing today. Yeah. Say again? We know what you're doing today. Well, yeah, one of many things, but uh, 